game is still fairly short and if you spend the entire weekend just playing it you'll either entirely complete it or almost entirely and with only one difficulty setting and to my knowledge no unlockables there is not a lot of replayability value the, the dialogue is again teenage like but not terribly annoying the characters also often verbally react to what they see and this is very credible and well the voice acting with a couple of exceptions is really really good I was completely sold on these characters the boss fights are very challenging the boss fights are challenging at times downright frustrating but ultimately very satisfying and every single one of them is quite memorable but yeah one of those few sequels that actually outdoes the first one and takes what the first had and improves upon it and also just similar enough that you don't feel alienated but also different enough that you don't feel like it's a retread not a clone of any other game and just a lot of fun to play. Anyway, those were my spoiler free reviews of the Obscure series. I hope there are more games to come, and I hope you enjoyed it. See you next time. Okay, starting with the first Obscure. The obvious problem is, why didn't this happen sooner? I mean, once you get into the story and the backstory of the school and the events, you find out that, you know, plenty of children have disappeared. I think I read at one point in the game it was like at least a dozen. So, you know, what, did no one else ever think of, hey, let's actually go see if we can find them? They didn't exactly do that well at covering their tracks. I suppose you could say that, you know, some of the weapons you find might be evidence of others who've tried to reveal the truth. And there certainly is that one bit where you find a message saying, look at this particular place and you'll find evidence, a while after you find the evidence. But anyway, still, you know, what makes these kids so special? What makes them succeed if there have been other attempts? And if not, why did they think of it first? They didn't seem to be that smart. Was anyone else disappointed when they got into the dormitory and it really wasn't anything? I mean, you read that that was where a lot of the kids went missing and, you know, once they locked up that place, everything got better. You know, right before I entered it, one of the characters said, this is where all those kids disappeared. And then you go in, fight a couple of monsters, I think you fight one of the big ones and all it turns out to be is you know I remember evidence or something nothing big nothing you know no boss why did they build it up so much is it just me or did the Freedmans really not need to be twins couldn't they just have been regular brothers I don't know was it so that you could compare the two so that when you looked at Friedman the plant man you know you'd know oh he looked like that guy was anyone else annoyed that literally everyone there was, you know, working against the kids as we found out everyone was in on it? How long had the school nurse and that teacher dude been infected since, I mean, they seemed to have been exposed to sunlight? And at the end of the game, one of the Freedmans, I don't remember their names, and certainly not which is which, tells the teacher, no, you can't use the antidote at this point, it's too late. Also, for how long had the school nurse actually been insane? I mean, we don't hear about her, like, having gone missing and then suddenly she's there again, but now she's insane. I mean, was she not insane earlier that day? There are a lot of plot holes once you actually stop to consider it, but it does also hit on all the notes for, you know, a horror film. You know, you have them isolated, they don't really get help from anyone. Someone's gone insane. Even the guy they thought was helping them was, you know, bad somewhat. See if this scene rings a bell for anybody. It, it can't be. But it is. It is. Maybe if I just took these pictures down I could actually compare them instead of walking back and forth all the time. 
I don't know, maybe Josh just didn't really want to mess with anything, the reporter in him. I don't know. Did anybody else think that there really weren't a lot of puzzles in this game? I mean, you explore, and then you find a thing or two, and then you put it in the place that it obviously goes, and then you get further, and... I don't know, maybe it's just me. I quite like the twist that you actually get captured, and then you have had the stuff injected into you. That was really cool. Being forced to be part of that, that you were trying to fight, kind of reminds me of Cigarette Burns, and I'm not going to explain why for anybody who hasn't already seen Cigarette Burns. If you like John Carpenter, watch Cigarette Burns. If you have no idea what Cigarette Burns is, it's one of his episodes on the Masters of Horror television series. Those are my thoughts on the first one, so moving on to Obscure 2 or Obscure the Aftermath. To some extent in this one also, why didn't it happen sooner? And I'm also not 100% clear on why exactly the kids mutated, because that's how I understood it, that the kids mutate and the rest of the game you're fighting, you know, your former classmates and such. I guess it was because they smell the flower, and I guess that means we're supposed to assume that no one but our seven leads had, you know, a coke after they smelled the flower. Which I find a little hard to swallow, but I don't know, maybe there was some other reason and I missed it. I have only played these two games once each. I'm also not 100% clear on why Quasi Loco ran around killing people. I get that he's Friedman's apparently retarded kid, and because Friedman nearly died, he made these hallucinogenic flowers to help him dream. And then I guess what happened was that these flowers just, you know, kept growing out of the place that Friedman and him were at, and, you know, these college kids picked them up. Unlike in the first one, where kids were being abducted from this high school and experimented on. So, yeah, why exactly did, you know, Mr. Hunchback go around killing people with his chainsaw? I don't know, maybe they wanted to go for more of a teen slasher flake thing. Big thumbs up on the duel of the chainsaws. That kicked ass. And also just that boss fight in general where you, you know, first fight off the chainsaw wielding madman, then shoot at the plant until one of the arms fall off, and then go and chainsaw through one of these plant limbs. The recurring boss fights against Kenny were really cool, and I love how Kenny and Sven were kind of going on different journeys, you know. They start out at the same place. They start out as the jock, who's strong and who is attracted to Amy. Sven winds up dying because he's willing to go so far to save Amy, and Kenny mutates and impregnates Amy with his plant seed. And then you have Shannon and Stan facing off against Kenny. Excellent. And near the end, with Stan dumping his pills as, you know, the final sign of him moving away from what Kenny did and became, and beginning to get to the point that Shannon was at. I also thought the tragedy of Corey was pretty good, with him eventually, you know, committing suicide because he could not live without May and Kenny had killed her. I also really like how Amy, throughout being this image of virility and fertility, ends up carrying Kenny's demented, disgusting plant seed. You know, taking something that we're so attracted to and turning it into something so disgusting. That was really good. I also thought that the June May thing worked pretty well, you know, twin sisters, the dominant sister, and then you just exactly miss your opportunity to save her. In general in this, when someone died, I cared. And I cared when Kenny turned into a monster. They had all been, you know, developed and I had gotten to like at least aspects of them so that when something tragic happened to them, I felt it, you know?